follow it, but it'll be if you speak to me about the book. Okay, perfect. Because I'm on board. So okay, that's great. Thank you. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for the academic procession and the Chancellor. I declare that the 569th Convocation of McMaster University for the conferring of degrees is now in session. I didn't want you to stand too long. Please be seated. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Ken Cruikshank, Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and proud father of an alumnus of the Arts and Science program. So I guess that qualifies me to speak and welcome you to be the first person to welcome you to this event. This afternoon, I have the great honor of welcoming all of you, graduates and guests, to this convocation ceremony. I would like to start by recognizing and acknowledging that we meet today on the traditional territories of the Mississauga Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. This is an important starting point and it's worth thinking about. It's a reminder that although you graduating students have many assignments behind you, there are many more waiting for you in our society. Those of us who live in Canada for any length of time are having to come to terms with the fact that many of us are settlers who share this land with dispossessed but enormously resilient First Nations. We are only starting to understand what that means. And we need all of the graduates to help. The Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement was first negotiated among First Nations in a creative attempt to resolve conflict and share the abundant resources of the Great Lakes region. Its principles are ones that we need to find ways to incorporate into our current world. We only have one dish that we need to share, the earth. We need to learn to take only what we need leave something for others, including future generations, and we need to learn how to keep one dish clean and abundant. And we're going to need help. So how's that for two small future assignments? 
I believe that your time in the many and varied humanities programs or the arts and science program have strengthened your ability to help. We have invited you to different worlds so that you can better appreciate and understand diverse perspectives. We have encouraged you to listen, to really listen, to learn, to really learn from others. We've invited you to reflect critically on the world, to think hard and make judgments about what we need to value and what we need to change. And we have encouraged you to think clearly and communicate effectively so as to engage in civil discussions about the past, the present, and the future. So equipped, we know that you will, in your own way, serve as the leaders of tomorrow and the agents of change who can help us build a brighter world. But let's leave that for another day. For today, savor this moment and celebrate your accomplishments and the accomplishments of your fellow students. This ceremony is in part our way of thanking you and those many people who have supported you along the way, some of them who will be in the hall today. On behalf of the faculty, I particularly want to thank the graduates for the energy, enthusiasm, and creativity that you brought to our classrooms, our laboratories, and our performance spaces. We learned a lot from you, and we are the better for it. Thank you and congratulations. There are others here to celebrate and bear witness to your achievements. I'd like to take the opportunity to acknowledge some of the notable leaders joining me on the stage today. Dr. Suzanne Labarge, Chancellor. Dr. Patrick Dean, President and Vice Chancellor. Dr. David Wilkinson, Provost and Vice President Academic and today's Master of Ceremonies. Ms. Mary Williams, Vice President, University Advancement. And there are others up on the stage, but I won't list them all. There are associate and assistant vice presidents, associate and assistant deans, directors, chairs, faculty members, and of course, honored guests. I have one last thing that I need to say. Before we start our formal program, may I ask everyone in the hall to switch off any electronic device that otherwise will undoubtedly ring or beep or play your favorite theme song at the most in inappropriate time during this ceremony. Thank you. I'd like to now call upon our Chancellor, Dr. Suzanne Labarge, to make her own welcoming remarks. Welcome, honored guests, staff, faculty, family, friends, and most importantly, graduates. This is an exciting day for all of you who are graduating today, as well as for all of those people who have supported you and stood behind you, and in many cases have had a key role in you being here today. You've achieved a great deal to get here, and you should all be very proud of your success and looking forward to what the future might bring. Congratulations, and enjoy the ceremony. I am Dr. David Wilkinson, Provost and Vice President Academic of the University. I have the great pleasure of being your Masters of Ceremony this afternoon. I would first like to welcome Dr. Patrick Dean, President and Vice Chancellor to the podium who will be presenting our honorary degree recipient. Madam Chancellor, by the authority of the Senate of McMaster University, I have the honor to present Sarah Polly. Sarah Polly is one of Canada's strongest artistic voices, an actor, director, writer, producer, and activist she became a household name as a child actor, portraying Sarah Stanley in CBC's Road to Avonlea. She won Gemini Awards on three occasions for that role, 
adding to what was already an impressive list of acting accolades. She had earned the lead role in Terry Gilliam's groundbreaking film, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, and received a Gemini Award for Best Supporting Actress in the TV movie Lantern Hill. Her work with Atta McGowan in Exotica and The Sweet Hereafter helped signal Ms. Polly's commitment to working extensively in independent Canadian cinema, helping to elevate a number of films with both the quality of her work and her high profile. She won a Genie Award for her role in Isabel Croisset's My Life Without Me. As Ms. Polly continued to act in an impressive list of movies and television series, including David Cronenberg's Existence, uh, Doug Lyman's Go, Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead, and the series Slings and Arrows, she was building her credentials and accomplishments behind the camera as well. Working initially in short films, her writer-director turn with the feature length Away From Her, based on the short story The Bear Came Over the Mountain by Nobel Prize winner Alice Munro, was rewarded with an Academy Award nomination for Best Adapted Screenplay. In total, the film was nominated for more than 100 awards, winning more than five dozen, including six Genie Awards. One of those was the award for best achievement in directing, making Ms. Polly the first woman to win that award. Ms. Polly directed the critically acclaimed feature, Take This Waltz, starring Michelle Williams and Seth Rogen, and then the award-winning and intensely personal documentary, Stories We Tell, based on her own family's mysteries. Among the many awards that film earned were Best Documentary Screenplay from the Writers Guild of America and Best Nonfiction Film from the New York Film Critics Circle Awards. She is currently the writer-producer of the new CBC Netflix co-produced miniseries Alias Grace, based on Margaret Atwood novel of the same name. Ms. Polly has been a longtime advocate for the Canadian film industry. She consistently adapts Canadian authors and supports other Canadian filmmakers while campaigning frequently to raise the profile of Canadian art and entertainment. She is also active in issues related to politics and social justice. She was part of David Miller's transition advisory team when he became mayor of Toronto. She has been involved with the New Democratic Party and she has worked as a volunteer for the Ontario Coalition Against Poverty and the Canadian Peace Alliance. In 2013, she was a lead organizer of the campaign to demand the release of John Grayson and Tariq Lubani from jail in Egypt. Madam Chancellor, Sarah Polly is an officer of the Order of Canada and a recipient of the National Arts Centre Award. She has been recognized for her excellence as an artist her commitment to sustaining and enriching Canadian culture, and her dedication to social justice here in her home nation and abroad. Today, I ask that you add to Ms. Polly's list of honors by conferring upon her the degree Doctor of Letters Honoris Causa. Sarah Pauling, by the authority of McMaster University Senate, I have the great pleasure to confer upon you the degree Doctor of Letters Honors Causa in McMaster University with all the rights and privileges pertaining to that degree. Congratulations. I would now like to invite Dr. Polly to deliver the convocation address. Madam Chancellor, President Dean, honored guests, graduates, family and friends. I am very honored to be asked to be part of this day. 
this is an amazing place. I'm not saying that because that's what you're supposed to say at a convocation. I'm saying that because if I could do it all over again and have a university education, or if I ever decided to pursue one in the future, this is where I'd wanna be. I love the kind of thinking this place fosters. I love how non-linear it is. I love the curiosity and intense love of learning I come across when I talk to people who have been through this institution like yourselves. Congratulations to the graduates of 2017. I hope you feel very proud of what you've accomplished and relieved that this day is finally here. And I imagine that those feelings are intermingled with a certain amount of fear. Fear of what comes next, who you will become, how you will overcome the inner and outer obstacles of your life. And I imagine you all have some specific fears that you walk alongside and wonder if you will ever conquer, or better yet, make friends with. Which brings me to the point of my speech today. I myself have a certain degree of fear about standing here in front of you. That's not only because I'm married to a Mac Artsci grad and he and his friends still make fun of how terrible the convocation speech was in 2001. They're still making fun of it, it's 16 years ago. So I won't name names of who gave that convocation speech, but let's just say the continual mockery of it over the last 16 years is not comforting to someone standing in my spot right now. <laughs> but that, oddly enough, is not why I'm afraid. I'm afraid because I have terrible debilitating stage fright. And right now, as I accept this incredible honor, I am in deep relationship with that fear. Here is something crucial that I've learned in preparation for being up here today. If you escape what you are afraid of, the fear gets bigger. I'm going to tell you the story of my fear of being on a stage, where it came from, what I've learned from it. I wanna tell you this because all I know how to do is tell stories, usually overly personal ones. And while I'm not great at doling out advice, I do feel compelled to share something meaningful with you on such a special day, something I've learned the hard way. I've been given such a generous introduction here today. I'd like to pull back the curtain a bit and show you some of the intense vulnerability because it's something that we all share and too often feel we should hide. My stage fright began when I was 15 years old and I was playing the lead role in Alice Through the Looking Glass at Stratford. I didn't know if I could handle being on a stage. I had doubts I should have been given such a big role given that it was my very first stage experience. To my surprise, I loved rehearsals and the first 20 shows felt like pure magic. After that, I went on automatic pilot for a while, and then something happened. I began to develop a tick. I'd never done theater before, so during rehearsals, the voice coach, in order to teach me to project the last syllable of words to the back of the house, had advised me to imagine there was an imaginary vowel on the end of each word. So for instance, in my mind, I was supposed to imagine that the word queen had a vowel on the end of it, like queen -a. I repeat, I was supposed to imagine this in my mind. The goal was that this thought would lead to the last consonant being heard clearly. You can see where this is going. About halfway through the run of the play, it was gently pointed out to me that I was actually putting a very loud vo vowel on the end of every single word. Duh. <laughs> so I worked hard on it, and while I lost the tick within a couple of shows, it made me feel that the me inside that I'd been afraid of, the one who really didn't know what she was doing after all, had made herself known and was very real. Every moment after that was terror. I would count down the minutes to 7.30 every night when I would walk onto that stage, certain that I would fail. Alice has to run to stand still. She goes through a looking glass where nothing is as it should be. The laws of the world do not apply. Everything is chaos. And somehow within the turmoil of my adolescence, this all seemed very real to me. I felt that everything was upside down, backwards, and that everyone in the audience every night had come to see me fail. I would sob for hours, curled into a fetal position in the basement of the theater before each show, and the only way I could get myself up and out onto that stage every night was to promise myself that if I got myself out for that one night, that one show, I would never make myself do it again. But it was a lie. I did it again every night, night after night, day after day, until one day, the me that I was making that bargain with stopped believing the false promises and said, no more. At the time, I could think of only one way out. Years earlier, I'd been diagnosed with severe scoliosis and I'd been told that I needed major spinal surgery. I had avoided doctor's appointments for a very long time because nothing, up until then, had scared me more than the prospect of that surgery. But one weekend, measuring terrors against each other, 
I got on a train to Toronto and met with my surgeon. I told him I was ready for surgery at the next available date, that I was in debilitating pain, and that I needed to drop out of the play I was in. He said it was unusual for scoliosis to create such terrible pain, um, but he added he once had a patient who, even though he wasn't in a ton of pain, really needed to get out of baseball. <laughs> so he'd written him a note. Was that what I needed? I was immensely grateful for his compassion. I still am, and so I said yes. He wrote me a letter and he booked me a surgery date and that got me out of the play. By the time I finally dropped out, I had made it through something like 58 shows of 65. I was too ashamed and perhaps too young to know how to ask for help. I was embarrassed by having the fear at all and I was sure that this was proof that I really was a fraud after all, undeserving of my place on that stage. I told no one the truth about this for many years. I'm 38 now, and for the last 23 years, I've had frequent nightmares that I'm on that stage again, caught, not knowing my lines, not knowing how to fake my way through it, a little Alice Liddell dress ripping at the seams. I'm sure that every one of us in this room today has a version of this story, something you didn't confront, something you can't figure out how to confront, or if you ever will. I ran away from my fear, I escaped, and so the fear grew. Since escaping that play, I have never stopped being petrified by the idea of being on a stage, and I avoid it whenever I can. In recent months, nightmare has changed to being here today in front of all of you, <laughs> having forgotten my speech at home. So I enlisted the help of someone who specializes in this kind of anxiety in performers and athletes, and it's been incredibly fruitful and interesting. I'm slowly discovering more about the origins of my fears, and while it's painful and sometimes complicated, it's far more interesting to sit right in the middle of it than to keep running away from it. A part of the work has been asking deeply, why do I want to stand up here today? Beyond the beautiful honor of receiving this honorary doctorate, why am I here? Why would I stand up here despite the crushing fear I've been feeling in anticipation of it? And by the way, this theater is much bigger than I imagined it would be. How's that possible? So I had a revelation on this matter a few weeks ago when I took my oldest daughter, who's five years old now, to a birthday party. And there were a bunch of people playing guitar on stage, and she suddenly grabbed a small ukulele, jumped up on stage, and started strumming along with them. She's always done this sudden rushing of stages with no self-consciousness whatsoever. And I watched her marveling at her lack of fear. And then I watched her face as slowly she realized what a risk it all was. She looked at the faces staring up at her and she started sobbing. She ran off the stage and she curled into my lap and she said, Mama, it's so scary, I'm so scared. I hugged her and I said, I knew that feeling. And silently I mourned her discovery of inhibition, the end of her not knowing to be afraid. And then suddenly, she leapt back up on that stage. The tears were still coming down, but she just kept strumming along until the tears stopped. She started aggressively suggesting other songs to her fellow musicians. <laughs> I thought, that's what I wanna be like when I grow up. I think it's a reasonable goal to have and maybe one worthy of all of us here today. I strive now to have the kind of bravery where you not only feel the fear, but if you fall down in public and everyone sees your fear, you just acknowledge it and you get back up again. So despite my terror, I wanted very much to be here today more than I wanted to listen to my fear. And it is exhilarating to walk right into the middle of a fear and stand here in the center of it because you know that it's worth it to you. I spent a long time thinking I needed to conquer my fear before I could ever be on a stage again. But actually, it's not a prerequisite for doing what you wanna do. Action and fear can coexist if you let them. And moments like these feel like life to me. I can think of no greater honor than to be here with you today as you celebrate what you have accomplished. To get to congratulate you and get to say to you, have a beautiful life, your life. And to do that, you can't avoid the edges. Don't escape the things that scare you. Move directly into them to live the life that you want. Because what is the point of a life without edges? without fear, without finding out what will happen if you don't escape it. 
So be scared if you are, feel a fr like a fraud if you must, everyone does, but just do it all anyway. It is a privilege to stand here in front of you and to receive this honor. Thank you so much for having me. It's an enormous pleasure to be able to welcome Sarah Pauly to the McMaster family. Um, she's an inspiration for, for, for all of us, and you heard a lot of it in the citation. But I think a lot of us, when we look at an honorary degree recipient, say, well, you know, they're smarter than I am anyway, and they probably worked harder. I think what she's brought home to us is a lot more than that. To get through to where you want takes courage as well as hard work. And as Canadians, I think we've enormously benefited from her, and I can't thank her enough. And as I say, we are delighted now to have her as part of our family. Thank you, Dr. Pauly. Dr. Patrick Dean will now come forward to present the graduates to our Chancellor for admission to their degrees. Will the graduates please stand? Madam Chancellor, on behalf of McMaster University Senate, I present to you these candidates in order that you may confer the appropriate degrees upon them. And I bear witness that they are worthy and suitable. May I also request that you confer the appropriate degrees in absentia upon all those candidates who have successfully completed the required course of study, but who are not present. Graduands, by my authority and that of the McMaster University Senate, I have the great pleasure to admit those before me today and those in absentia to their individual degrees in McMaster University with all the rights and privileges pertaining to those degrees. My sincere congratulations to you all. Please be seated. Graduates, I now ask each of you to join me on stage so that the Chancellor and I may welcome you to the McMaster Community of Scholars.
Ladies and gentlemen, so that each graduate's name may be heard, it will be appreciated if during the presentation of the graduates, you would hold your collective applause to the end of each degree category. Thank you. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Doctor of Philosophy. Jonathan Matthew Reeves. Patricia White. Castle Bilsey. Sarah Olutala. Shea Richard Paz Sweeney. Jeffrey D'Souza. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Master of Arts. Anand Duma. Aaron Bradley Mishner. Olivia Grace Falk. Afaf Zahid. <laughs> Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Master of Communications Management. Caroline Elise Burke. Paminda S. Chohan. Michal Halsey. John David Morgan. Aislinn Mary Elizabeth Marshner. Onyi Ijoma Oyedele. Julia Rim Shepherd. Gabrielle Roy. Christopher Smiley. Adriana Sosa Cravioto. Gail Anthea Strand. Megan Jesse Venaz.
Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Arts Honors. Megan Abbey. Katie Avels. Nardos Abraha. Tessa Marie Al. Joanne Alatalabani. Tasnim Albaba. Louis Joshua Albano. Rahim Aman. <laughs> Juliet Anyonem Amu. Sharmin Anam. Adrian Andrus. Catherine Noel Annabel. Carolyn Archana Anton. Santina Armetta Arbondi. Oliver Bachman. <laughs> Megan Elizabeth Barkley. Nama Bawa. Madison Beach. Danielle Beatty. Mackenzie Ann Beatty. Jessica Ann Bernard. Adam Nicholas Blackburn. Tanner Joseph Blom. Stacy Vanessa Bob. Mateos Bobo. Katerina Berenger. Nicholas Bomarito. Alma Rita Bukhalad. Ewurama Bru. Matthew Brisland. Danielle Francis Brown. Rochelle Brown. Emily Margaret Buddle. Michelle Ann Burton. Rebecca Butler. Rachel Aaron Butts. Anna Maria Paula Buccelli. Gabrielle Bernice Cardwell. Kelsey Carrero. Robert Casabo. Sarah Louise Catalano. Jada Charon. 
Sanya Chung. Claudia Olga Schmiel. James Clark. Shelby Olivia Clements. Kyla Wilma Coburn. Bianca Marie Colangelo. Michaela Corcoran. Jiminy Costa. Tyler Craig. Zachary David Carroll Cropper. JC Cruz. Kelsey Cruz. Carling Courtney Jane Dondria. Amy Shannon D'Souza. Jessica Jenneth Del Pret Silva. Francesca Delano. Danny Demianenko. Julie Ann Christina Denauden. Jamie Graydon Dennison. Sarah Devlin. Alyssa Rose Day. Samantha Diaz. Jordana Taylor Di Benedetto. Xiao Chin Du. <laughs> Veronica Duff. Jacqueline Ibo. Jonathan Wayne Eggleton. Marwa Eid. Yusuf El Abotaji. Kennedy Ellenson. Jason Lee Ehrlich. Jessica Escoto. Sidra Farouk. Brittany Farr. Olivia Ann Judith Pasulo. Shireen Fayed. Juliana Falenzer. Everett Ross Field. Elena Felice. Sarah Jane Forbes. Charlotte Ford. Vanessa Rihanna Francis. Amy Frankreiter. Richard Charles David Freeman.
Brian J. Valenzuela Gabby. Ella Gare. Mithothi Matthew Galopoulos. <laughs> Sophie Jeffrose. Santino Geis. Michael Anthony Genicaro. AJ Gooman. Fiona Marie Theodora Akides Gordon. Daniel Govidar. Kelly Aaron Grammer. Lauren Grammer. Rachel Graveline. Maxine Gravina. Marcus Patrick Greco. David Peter Grundy. Marco Guglielmo. Marine Claire Formanek Gustafson. Carla Monica Haddad. Allison Hamilton. Alexis Stephanie Harper. Liam Craig Harris. Brittany Hashchik. Courtney May Hinks. Alana Marlies Laddie. Victoria Maria Hogan. Lisa Louise Kathleen Holm. Kathy Huang. Aaron Craig Matthew Hubble. Leslie Humphreys. Cassandra Lynn Hutt. Mating Huang. Michaela Ioni. Elizabeth Lucy Ivanecki. Rashmi Jamdar. Gregory Jewell. Lauren Sidney Johnson. Kaylin Andrew Joseph. Catherine Rachel Kaspchek. Osner Kynek. Habiba Khalid. Hamza Mahmoud Khan. Nimra Khan. Zara Khan. Philip Kim. Erica Ko. Tina Kosick. Eldina Kovacevic. Pooja Kumar. 
Amanda Kung. Jordan Lalonde. Jessica Ray Lass. Catherine Elizabeth Lewis. Alice Lee. Anne's Lee. Melissa Lucetta. Jillian Elizabeth McDonald. David Benjamin Scott McFarlane. Rachel McIntyre. Sydney Deborah Mack. Zachary Shane McMillan. Ajahn Mahathiran. Emily May Mailing. Dylan James Mainprize. Mahin Mulek. Lisa Marshaldon. Dimitri Marco Merkic. Shane D. Marston. Ricky Jordan Martirano. Karen Stephanie Mateus Salas. Emily Matthew. Kimberly Amy Monder. Paige Valerie Maylott. Brendan James McAndrew. Nicole Margaret McDermott. Ashley McFarlane. Jenna McGill. John McGuire. Katie Megan McGurk. Patricia Mackay. Sabrina Michelle Marula. Noel Middleton. Andrew John Mitchell. Emma Victoria Mitchell. Jennifer Melissa Mitchell. Taylor John Mox. Maria Julia Molina. Marina Angelic Monahar. Griffin Moore. Stephen Joseph Morrill. Julia Isabel Mortimer. Nicole Moss. Suna Mumtaz. Matthew Patrick Murphy. Sherry Murray. 
Lauren Narain. Elizabeth Angelique Lemire Naylor. Jumiel Niazzi. Jacqueline Lee Nixon. Michael Nuttall. Adiola Ojo. I'm a Balanli Ola Bushula Ola Rewaju. Lindsay Taylor Old. Sarah Amal Buddy. Emma Orser Corney. Brooke Diane Osborne. Kate Rhiannon Oyston. Mariana Papa Constantino. Vashnavi Paramalingam. Emily Peck. Mitchell Harrison Peerless. Mark Pinard Brown. Jacob Playfair. Rafael Posada. Alitza Prodnik. Madison Pucci. Amy Ray McMaster. Melissa Nancy Razzo. Graham John Charles Ricketts Moncourt. Alexandria Elizabeth Ritchie. Nicole Elizabeth Roach. David Romano. Nicole Luciana Ruggiero. Sabrina Gabriella Russ. Natasha Salam. Angelica Ann Elizabeth Salfi. Serena Sabati. Kyle David Tickner Sanders. Jessica Serianius. Salvatore Thomas Sprega. Morgan Olivia Scalina. Nicole Scholin. Matthew Serafin. Josephine Sergi. Tile Shazad. Govind Sharma. Eileen Shorman. Andrew John Showers. Nicole Silva. Emily Amrita Singh. Corbett Jack Kirk Smith. Adele Sweet Chen So. Kelly Ann Sovereign. 
Betty Spurgeon. Holly Jane Stapleton. Anthony James Sathopoulos. Alisa Ann Stead. Laura Elizabeth Street. Richard Takat. Ashley Nicole Taylor. Luke Jonathan Tenage. <laughs> Chrysaline Ariel Teo. <laughs> Celine Thusafayam. <laughs> Sasha Thomas. Gemma Emily Wilson Todd. Kyle Todd. <laughs> Yusuf Toma. Ryan Ronald Torrens. Caitlin Marie Tracy Flaherty. Kathleen Isabel Tuck. Itnitha Uthayakumaran. Simon Vaca. Shane Henry Vandermeer. Shannon Leanne Vanderwerg. Austin J. Vanderham. <laughs> Julia Veronese. <laughs> Sasha Varelli. <laughs> Madison Vettoretto. <laughs> Sarah Virani. Michael David Waldock. Andrew Walker. Nestor Ivan Wanditsi. Chantel Jessica Helka Wark. Kaylee Watson. Daryl Christine Watson. Brody Justin Weld. Monica Vitrodek. Michaela Wong. Ali Yazdankia. Konstantinos Zafaridis. Salma Zaghal. Nadine Zahair. Oscar Zaranek. Caitlin Zarconi Beam. Zara Zidane. Carly Nicole Zedek. Brianne Lisa Rose Zelinski. Carolyn Adelina Zapieri.
Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Fine Arts Honors. Jaslyn Bangu. Laura Kate Brandreth. Justine Louisa Harper Sierramella. Michelle Dabrowski. Parker Simpson Flood. Stephanie Joanne Grant. Sally Lau. Camelia McLeod. Megan Emily McMurrick. Jonathan Lewis Mitchell. Tyler Jackson Poplar. Hillary Brooke Rosa. Oh, no. Hannah Maria Sampson. Oh, yeah. Vaishnavi Suthagar. Oh, no. Jennifer Nicole Tunyon. Tess Marie Weiser, Alexandra Frances Marie Walker, Cassandra Jean Wall, Serum Ye, Kian Yu Zhao. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Music Honors. Henry David Austria. Maggie Claire Barbario. Amy Champahom. Phil Chen. Alice Doucette. Shuo Feng. Simon Felice. Hannah Marie Glynn. <laughs> Kayla, Kayla Catherine Holmes. Alicia House. Sarah Lamb. Victoria Marie Mancini. <laughs> Alessandra Palermo. <laughs> Bethany Lee Puccia. Ashley Quintanilla. Robert Joseph Sevigny. Andre William St. Pierre.
Twyla Joan Vanderkoy. Lara Teresa Warren. William Tsang. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Arts and Science Honours. Shalini Ann Abisekara. Pearl Almeida. Madeline Jane Elizabeth Baker. Ayaz Barmel. Sunana Bazin. Christine Elizabeth Black. Marina Breeden. Benjamin Buckler. Miranda Dawn Carlson Strain. Christopher Chu. Eamon Colvin. Janine DeClerc. Kristen Marie Dozen. Louis Augustin Ferracuti. Mackenzie Bruce Gillies. Mesa Hawk. Yaroslava Ibragimova. Matthew Jordan. Gally Katz Nelson, Claire Aileen McDonald, Rubina Akram Malik, Alexandra Catherine Marcaccio. Alicia Danielle Martini. Kevin Michael Maynard. Catherine Mazaru. Annie Shaw Mills. Emma Mittermeyer. Mythali Nyer. Spencer James Nestico Simianu. Tisha Manish Kumar Parikh. Emily Bernadine Power. Varun Puri. Atika Kavi, Victoria Jean Rizdauskas, Shruti Lakshmi Ramesh, Alex Riccio Greenwell, Luisa Fernanda Ruiz Gutierrez.
Veronica Sackle. Sarah Sahota. Jennifer Helen Scora. Hamna Shahid. Rafaela Shamas. Allison Dana St. Pierre. Ali Tejani. Kristen Joan Webster. Spencer David Williams. Cassia Wojcik. Brianne Wolf. Eric Fraser's Notons. Madam Chancellor, may I present to you the following graduates of the degree Bachelor of Arts. Keldin Alsted. Marianne Rune Bashi Ali. Faisa Arain. Brooke Victoria Armstrong. Jesse Thomas Bernier. Oh, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Claudia Bilato. Jacob Theodore Brodnicki. John Lucas Brown. <laughs> Chupo Bobo Chow. Samantha Koffa. Jessica Feltrin. Lee Garrett Goldson. Odina Aleta Gonzalez. <laughs> Kayla Goff. <laughs> Celine Gru. <laughs> Evan Haskell Cowan. Jacob Alexander Helm. Megan Nicole Henderson. Darcy Hill. Victoria Ho. Bonita Lenore Jackson. John Patrick Fuad Kalenchuk. Yuan Shan Lai. Julian Alexander Maganino. Natalie Page Mann. Braden Michael Militante. Dahlia Omar. Brian Joseph Peterson. Yes, 
Ravan Ponumbala, Ponumbalam, sorry. Michelle Colette Prestage. Michaela Elizabeth Adelaide Randall. Andrew James Sinclair. Madeline Diane Karen Slafarski. Sienna Trijani. Joshua Woods. Judith Yaus. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in one more round of applause for all of the newest graduates of the class of 2017. I would now like to introduce Ms. Gally Katznelson, a graduate of the Arts and Science Honors Program, who will be delivering the valedictory address. Chancellor Labarge, President Dean, honored guests, family, friends, and fellow graduates, I am so honored to be standing here as the 2017 Arts and Science and Humanities Valedictorian. Over my years as a student of the humanities, I have taken a range of courses and almost even settled on a major a couple of times. There has been one constant in my life over the past four years, however, the dreaded question. So, what is it you really study? Standing here before you, having submitted my final paper and written my last exam, perhaps it's time I find an answer to this question. What did I really do in my university education? There is one thing I did quite a bit of, something I know many of us did quite a bit of. We did this in bed. We did this in libraries. We did this under some pretty extreme conditions. We wrote essays, lots of them. The students in this room who've taken French know that the word essay comes from the French word to try. So with that, allow me to try and define for you my university education. Step one, write an introduction. 12 hours before my first university paper was due, I found myself in Head and Hall, frantically typing the following words into Google, how to write an essay. <laughs> Hence, these steps. Step two, prepare a detailed outline of your ideas. I have mad respect for anyone who's able to do this. I've always been more of a dump all your ideas out and carve out some semblance of a meaning kind of student. So here goes. What have I learned in my university education? I learned to question everything. What is progress? What is justice? What is love? Okay, we all know the answer to that one is baby don't hurt me. <laughs> but besides asking questions, I learned to listen and to engage other understandings and experiences of the world. I learned that in the society that places so much anxious emphasis on the individual, we need to remember to care about others. I've seen this care modeled on campus from passionate students 
advocating for causes they care about through extracurriculars, to curious students speaking up at panel discussions, I have consistently been inspired and so proud of members of the socially conscious community for using their voices. I learned to use mine. I learned to get lost, and not just in the KTH basement. I learned to find myself and to get lost again. And I learned that sometimes not having a clear outline of where you're going makes the journey more interesting. Step three, state your thesis. Over our time at McMaster, we've been fortunate to peer through many lenses and examine a range of perspectives, gaining a deeper understanding of ourselves and of the world around us. Through this process, we've been encouraged to confront the suffering of others and to acknowledge our shared interdependence. So I guess the true essence, the main idea, the thesis of my degree was actually in the department of empathy. Step four, add quotations. Even if after four years, I'm still not sure which citation style to use, here's a quotation that articulates something I've learned here by American author, Dennis Lehane. Sympathy is easy because it comes from a position of power. Empathy is getting down on your knees, looking someone else in the eye and realizing you could be them and that all that separates you is luck. Step five, write a conclusion. Over the years, we learned that the world is vast, complex, imperfect, and needs improvement. It is a world that is racked by wars, a global refugee crisis, economic inequality, discrimination, and climate change. Luckily, we've spent these years filling up toolboxes to become critical thinking, imaginative, and empathetic citizens of this world. As we step beyond McMaster, it's important that we remember our duty of taking our toolboxes with us and using those tools. So in conclusion, let's not conclude our journey here today. Let's take all that we've learned and use it to work toward building a more peaceful, hospitable, shared, welcoming, and accountable world. Step six, get an edit. Class of 2017, we worked hard over the years, but we must remember that we would not be here without the help of some very special people. The professors and TAs who extended their time to us beyond the classroom, encouraged us to chase after our dreams, and wrote us those last minute reference letters. The staff who helped us figure out which courses we needed so that we could actually make it to graduation. The friends who made study sessions and heartaches more bearable and filled with laughter. Our families. Though many of us spent more time with the ancient Greeks over the past years than with you, without your unconditional love and support, we would not be here. Whoever your editors are, remember to thank them. Class of 2017, congratulations, and I can't wait to see where we go. Thank you very much, Kelly. May I call upon our president, Dr. Patrick Dean, who will present the Distinguished University Professor. Would Dr. Barry Allen please come forward? From time to time, the Senate of McMaster University awards the title of Distinguished University Professor to exceptional members of faculty whose contributions in scholarship and education are truly outstanding. Madam Chancellor, today, on behalf of the Senate of McMaster University, I have the honor to present McMaster's newest distinguished university professor, Dr. Barry Allen. 
a professor in the Department of Philosophy. Dr. Barry Allen is a prolific researcher and the author of five monographs published by some of the most prestigious academic presses in the world, including the presses of Columbia University, Cornell University, and Harvard University. His work includes Truth in Philosophy, Artifice and Design, Art and Technology in Human Experience, Knowledge and Civilization, Vanishing into Things, Knowledge in Chinese Tradition, and Striking Beauty, a philosophical look at the Asian martial arts. That latter work was selected as a choice outstanding academic title. Dr. Allen has also produced 27 peer-reviewed book chapters, 43 articles, 70 book reviews, and multiple conference presentations. He has been a visiting professor in cities as diverse as Hong Kong, Shanghai, Istanbul, and Halifax. And he has been an invited speaker in seven different countries. He is the associate editor of the Duke University Press journal, Common Knowledge. A recently elected fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Dr. Allen conducts research that crosses disciplines, cultures, and histories. His Royal Society citation describes his influential work in the philosophy of culture. Quote, Dr. Allen has worked to bridge the gap between analytic and continental philosophy, in aesthetics particularly on questions of design and the relationship to technology, and most recently on Asian philosophy, focusing particularly on moral and aesthetic elements in martial arts. He is a pioneer in this field and communicates effectively with scholars from both West and East. Dr. Allen's scholarship and mentorship have been magnets for a strong core of graduate students, including three doctoral students who have published their theses as books. He served as PhD program director from 2002 to 2004, and his other administrative contributions to the university include membership on both department and faculty tenure and promotion committees, participation on graduate council, and service as a faculty adjudicator for the Office of Academic Integrity. Congratulations, Dr. Allen. Very, very well done. Very well done. Very well done. Very well done. I would now like to introduce the Dean of Humanities, Dr. Ken Cruikshank, who will present the Dean's Medal for Excellence in the Humanities. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present the winners of the Dean's Medal for Excellence in the Humanities for Outstanding Academic Achievement. It's with great pleasure that I announce that this year's recipients are Maureen Gustafson, Erica Koh, Kelly Sovereign, Daryl Watson, and Costa Zavaridis. Congratulations.
Congratulations to you all. May I now introduce Mrs. Karen McQuig from the Alumni Association. Karen will now deliver the Alumni Association address. Chancellor Labarge, President Dean, McMaster faculty, fellow alumni, honored guests, and especially members of the McMaster class of 2017. I'd also like to say a very special thank you to Marina, who's part of the Arts and Science uh, graduating class. Uh, Marina, you're um, a sib to my niece, Erin. She's joined your sib family a couple years ago, and you've done a fantastic job of being a sib. But seriously, I've had to step up my game as an aunt because of your activities. So thank you for that, Marina. The first time we did this, it was 123 years ago, and there were 16 of you. The events of commencement, as convocation was known then, were a little different from today's ceremony. In 1894, McMaster's first convocation included a sermon, the reading of graduate theses, yes, they read them aloud, word for word, and we conferred 60 honorary degrees that day. The black graduation gowns back then were made of alpaca and lined with white satinette for the arts graduates and lavender for the graduates of theology. One of the graduates wearing alpaca that day was a young woman named Elizabeth Wells. She later published a description of the ceremony in Canadian Magazine. In that article, she wrote of McMaster's first convocation. The enthusiasm shown by the students who sat massed in the body of a large assembly showed plainly that they were filled with the spirit of loyalty to their university. Well, I'm not sure 16 people in alpaca gowns counts as a mass, but the feelings of enthusiasm and pride were likely valid observations. I hope you have similar feelings today. I know I did when I graduated from McMaster. Today, our university is very different from the McMaster Elizabeth Wells knew 123 years ago, and our institutional history and credentials are far more robust. Today, I hope that, you've earned, I hope that your McMaster has earned your enthusiasm and loyalty through its service, excellence, leadership, and accomplishment, just as you've worked hard to earn our pride in you and our loyalty to you as you become newest members of the McMaster alumni family. The McMaster Alumni Association goal is to take your connection to McMaster beyond the feelings that are so strong today and help them make them into a lifelong connection of substance. We want you to be involved with Mac like our oldest living graduate, Bruce McLean, from the class of 1933, three, pardon me, 1933, who was a very spry 106. It has been 84 years since Bruce walked across the stage at Convocation Hall to receive his degree, and he continues to attend Alumni Reunion Day each June, and I'm pretty sure it's not just because he keeps winning the oldest living graduate award. <laughs> As an aside, we've had to award Bruce with a new title, Honorary Oldest Living Graduate, for a couple of reasons. One, it's very difficult to find something new to buy a 106-year-old individual, and frankly, he really doesn't need much. And the second reason is for poor Doris Wertheim Sloan from the class of 1945, who's been showing up for 72 years and has never won the award till this year. <laughs> now, I'm pretty sure I know how maroon Bruce and Doris are, so I would encourage you to take a few moments after the ceremony to complete our How Maroon Are You quiz noted on the card you found on your seat today to have a little fun reflecting of your, at, reflecting of your time at McMaster. It will also lead you to the alumni website where you can learn more about what being a member of the Alumni Association can do for you. But all you really need to know now is that the McMaster Alumni Association and the Mac Alumni family can be part of your McMaster experience in a big way or in a small way, anytime you like. When you're ready, we'll be ready as well. So to the class of 2017, I offer you my most sincere congratulations on your academic accomplishments and on your graduation. You should be extremely proud of your accomplishments on behalf of Bruce, Doris, and 185,000 alumni around the world. Congratulations and welcome. Thank you, Karen. May I invite Dr. Dean back to the podium to deliver his President's Address. So, Madam Chancellor, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, graduates, 
It's a great privilege to share an occasion like this with all of you. Uh, it is the high point of the academic year convocation. It's a rite of passage that marks the movement of successive groups of students out into the world where they continue to take the message that your valedictorian so beautifully summarized for you. It is a world that really needs your talents and your gifts, uh, and I'm very confident in your ability to make the changes and transformations that will make this a brighter and happier planet. I wanted to talk to you, this is my, my delight as a frustrated teacher, I'm not in the classroom enough these days, so I take advantage of, the, of this occasion uh, to say a few things that are close to the heart before you head off. Canada's mandatory long-form census was restored, I think many of you will remember this, uh, approximately 18 months ago after being placed in abeyance uh, for many years. At that time, the Minister of Innovation, Science and Economic Development asserted that Canadians were, and this is a quote from him, reclaiming their right to accurate and reliable information on the basis of which they would be able to make sound decisions about their futures at the personal as well as the national level. Then last August, with the 2016 Census of Population now complete, Canada's chief statistician, Wayne Smith, pronounced it the best census ever, with an overall response rate of 98.4%, obviously the sign that we had been very frustrated at not being counted for all those years. A few weeks ago, at the start of May, Statistics Canada released a second series of data derived from the census, this time bearing on the age and sex of the Canadian population. And the report made big news. It made big news because of what the 2016 census had revealed, namely that Canada has in the last few years undergone a very significant generational shift. This is a quote from the StatsCan report. As a result of the rapid increase in the number of people 65 years of age and older since 2011, 2016 marked the first time that the census enumerated more seniors at 5.9 million than children 14 years of age and younger at 5.8 million. But what does this mean? But one thing it tells us is that the Canadian population is aging. Not that we didn't know that in a crude sense, of course, but the census story is all about changing proportions in the population. For the first time since Confederation in 1867, the seniors' share of the population now exceeds the children's share. And the group in between, the group in which I think almost all of you belong, that is to say our graduates, the group of 15 to 64 year olds, is shrinking as a proportion of the total population. I'm an English professor, so I, while I know I have a right to this kind of information, I, to be frank, never quite know what to do with it. The StatsCan <clears throat> report tells me that such knowledge, quote, will be especially helpful for adapting social programs for children, adults, and seniors to the new demographic reality. But I wonder about that. Undoubtedly, it will help us identify and understand the new demographic reality. But what it will mean to adapt to that reality is much more than a statistical question. Implicit in the phrase demographic reality is an assumption that certain consequences must inevitably follow the shift. For example, that funding for health and social programs will now move proportionately to favor the aging and the elderly, even as the working population that must pay for those programs is shrinking. That may be logical, and providing proper care to the elderly, no matter how numerous they are, should be a non-negotiable requirement in a civilized nation. But there are nevertheless vitally important questions we must still ask about the condition of and the prospects for the younger generation in this scenario. 
Now, these are especially important questions to ask in 2017, as Canada marks 150 years as a nation. Anniversaries like this provoke retrospection, and they have done so in a very healthy way across campuses uh, this year, as communities have turned their minds to think about the legacy of the residential school system and some of the darker aspects of Canadian history. These occasions are also times uh, that seem to provide an opportunity for jingoism and mindless patriotic fervor, and I dare say we'll see plenty of that when July the 1st rolls around. But our sesquicentennial is also an occasion to look into the future, imagining what Canada will become in the next 50 or 100 years. And it is in that context that the 2016 census results are so thought-provoking. We are being told that a far-reaching and unprecedented generational shift is happening right now, just as we're running the anniversary flag up the pole. But interestingly, it is a shift that sends us back in history to our last big national event, the centennial in 1967. It is interesting to me because that year coincided with another very significant and related generational shift. The middle of the 60s is generally understood to be the end point of the baby boom, the population surge which began in 1946 after the end of the Second World War. And it is the aging members of that generation whose entry into the ranks of seniors over the last few years have given rise to the demographic changes that the 2016 census recently revealed. Now, I'm a baby boomer, and it was my generation that seemed so incomprehensible to our parents that a special term had to be coined to describe the phenomenon. The term was the generation gap. And one experienced the generation gap as significant and sometimes profound differences of opinion about music, politics, personal values, and a host of other topics. Families like my own, as I recall, became cultural battlegrounds. I remember my father inexplicably, to me at least, being plunged into a red-faced fury when he discovered in my elder brother's clothing drawer a pair of blue jeans. And not just a pair of blue jeans, a pair of blue jeans with an, extravag an extravagant applique floral design. And also a shirt with, of all things, puffed sleeves. You all know something of 60s fashions to imagine these abominations. So my own differences with my parents were less sartorial than they were political in nature. But as I've reflected on those times, I've come to understand that those two categories of resistance, in terms of dress and in terms of politics, were for my generation not really separable. To a degree not since seen in the West, how, or indeed whether, one clothed one's body was contested terrain between the generations, a language through which other, sometimes deeply divergent views expressed themselves. The generation gap was a term invented by sociologists building on the theory of generations developed by Karl Mannheim in the 1920s. For Mannheim, a generation was not simply a cohort of people born and achieving maturity between specified years. It was such a cohort for sure, but also one upon which certain major historical events had registered an impact. A generation was, in other words, shaped by its particular historical experience. Mine was, for example, post-war and post-Hiroshima, but definitely not post-nuclear, as we lived in daily apprehension of a nuclear holocaust. My wife remembers that as a child in school, she was trained to climb under her desk and cover her head in anticipation of an atomic blast, as if that would help at all. And it would be indeed surprising if such practices had not left an indelible mark on the generation for which they were routine and normal. 
While the 2016 Canadian population census seems to confirm that we're in the midst of a decisive generational shift, it is obviously far too early to speculate on the qualitative dimensions of whatever gap might open up between your generation and mine. Indeed, it is entirely possible, notwithstanding Mannheim's implication, that some sort of generational consciousness must inevitably emerge, that dislocation and discontinuity will not define the ways in which we relate to each other. There will certainly be economic and other consequences of the aging of the Canadian population. And today, as I speak to an auditorium full of graduates from the Faculty of Humanities and from the Arts and Science program, I'm acutely conscious of the need that society will have for the gifts, the talents, and the skills that you have learned in your studies. But I am profoundly hopeful about the future because of my faith in all of you. The well-known anthropologist Margaret Mead published in 1970 a serious study of intergenerational relations. The book is called Culture and Commitment, a study of the generation gap, in which she beautifully captured the service which every new generation performs for its society and for humanity at large. The young, she wrote, are free to act on their own initiative and can lead their elders in the direction of the unknown. The young must ask the questions that we would never think to ask, and through creativity, curiosity, and innovativeness, find answers that their elders cannot imagine. I have worked in universities for more than 40 years and have always, indeed increasingly, been invigorated by the way in which students have sought to challenge received wisdom and to advance the human intellectual and social project. If there was ever a gap between us, and I suppose following Mannheim that there must always be at least some intergenerational discontinuities. I have strained to hear your voices from the other side and to learn from what you have had to say and from what you have done. Margaret Mead felt that while the young should be free to act upon their initiative, they also needed somehow to reestablish trust with their elders so that the elders will be permitted, she said, to work with them on the answers. According to that vision of generational shift then, your future is a project on which we collaborate. My generation providing what knowledge and wisdom we can, but depending on you to surpass us in making this a brighter world. I haven't dwelt on the challenges you will face, except of course for the looming healthcare problem in our country. And I haven't talked more broadly about the role of my generation in creating some of those challenges and obstacles. This is meant to be an upbeat occasion after all. But if you need to trust us in order to achieve the solutions you seek, we need to admit our failings and shortcomings and trust to your energy, creativity, and positive values. I became an educator four decades ago, not just for something to do, but for something I wanted to see created, a better, more just society. The well-being of people and of the communities they comprise has been my preoccupation. And unlike many of my peers, I do not believe that my generation was unique in its idealism, altruism, and its social conscience. I know from working with many of you that those three things are as much, if not much more alive amongst you than they ever were amongst my peers. And that is in its own way a bit of a miracle given the state of the world that we're in the process of handing over to you. We delight in your success. We are in awe of your talent. 
and we are enormously excited to see where you will take us. My very best wishes go with you all. Thank you very much, President Dean. I think I can say that we all share his admiration for what you bring to the table and our hopes for you in the future. So congratulations to the class of 2017. Um, as a fellow uh, alumni to your valedictorian, I can only concur with her comment about she's looking forward to seeing where you all go from here. I'm gonna go back, since Dr. Dean did open the question of age, to the fact that it's actually 50 years ago that I graduated from McMaster in 1967. And I don't think it's just a question of old age because I forgot some of this stuff almost immediately after leaving, which is, I don't remember who the chancellor was. I think it may have taken me a year or two to forget who the president was. But I do remember the end of the ceremony. I remember the ceremony and I remember being there with my parents who were so proud of our graduation and the, the pride of sharing the day with them. And I'm hoping all of you have that experience today. But I want to come back to it as well because it is something unique that you have today. This graduation is about you as individuals, not you as a group, despite the fact that you are and have all worked together, you personally had to do what was necessary to be here, to stand on this stage, to be hooded. And I think that is enormously important. All of you will agree you couldn't have done it on your own. Your parents, your friends, your teachers all provided enormous support. But you had to be willing to accept that support. You had to be willing to learn you had to be willing to work hard. So again, it is rare in life you will find that individual, you are recognized as an individual for what you have accomplished, and that is what we are doing today. So congratulations again. <laughs> there are just a couple of other things I'd like to mention that I carried away from my time at McMaster. One, obviously, was the fact that I don't remember anything specific in any of the courses I took, but it provided an incredible basis of knowledge on which I could build for the future and did. What it also did, which was even more interesting, was reawaken curiosity. I mean, we're all excited when a five-year-old says why, how, what. We are less tolerant when adults do it, and I think that's our mistake. And you have been a chance, and particularly in the courses you have been taking, is those questions are always there. And all I want to do is to encourage you to continue to ask them. It's that that will take you forward in your career. It will take you forward in society. Because the why will lead you to say, and what can I do? And it's the diversity of what you can do that will make the difference to society. So I just think, I mean, we have seen it. Our honorary degree recipient, Dr. Polly, is a perfect example of what happens when you say, why and what can I do? And again, I wish that kind of future for all of you. So again, I hope all, I wish you all very much the best uh, in whatever you decide to do from now on. Now, before you disappear to go into various celebrations that you're planning, I'm sure, I have a couple of housekeeping items to tell you about before we close. The reception for humanity graduates and their guests will be immediately following the ceremony at the Art Gallery of Hamilton in the Pavilion and Sculpture Garden. The reception for the Arts and Science Program graduates and their guests will be immediately following the ceremony at the David Braley Health Science Center. Flowers that have been delivered for graduates will be available at the coat check in the main lobby. I would ask that you please remain standing at your seats until the academic procession and the graduates have left the hall. Finally, please join now in the singing of our national anthem. After the singing of the anthem, this convocation stands adjourned. <laughs>